Daniel says the audio is good, so uh, we're going to get going here. Welcome to Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's online retreat for the English congregation. This is our second session. Uh, last night was the first session at 8 p.m., so the video uh, will be posted to Victoria Chinese Alliance's Facebook page uh, and their website as well, so you can check out the first video there. Uh, second session is tonight, 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, I'm not going to speak for a full hour. I'll probably speak for about... 30 minutes and then we can have some discussion uh, some Q&A you can bring any comments you might have or any verses you want to share that are applicable or that you just want to share to encourage people in this time uh, the third session will be next Saturday 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. that's May 2nd 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. and then the fourth session will be the Sunday morning um, sermon for the for the English congregation at Victoria Chinese Alliance Church and that will be posted on their website at the service the english congregation service begins at 9 a.m may 3rd that'll be the fourth session so thanks everybody uh for being with us tonight um we talked last last night about how we can retreat on jesus uh, particularly in these times because he's fully god so we've been in the book of hebrews we've been talking about how we can retreat on and retreat to jesus because of who he is and tonight we're going to be talking about how we can retreat on him because he's fully human and he's able to identify with the things that we're going through, the things that we have gone through. And we talked last night about how we can we can retreat on him because he's all powerful and he's actually able to act in situations like we're facing right now. So we talked about how he is um, omniscient, which is he knows everything. So he knows everything that you're going through. We talked about how he's omnipresent, which means that he's everywhere present. So he's actually with you in the different things you're experiencing I know sometimes when we feel like things are overwhelming or we feel like nobody cares, it kind of feels like, well, God must be looking out for those other people, but he's nowhere to be found in my life. Uh, but that's not true. He's with you at all times in all places. Uh, and then we talked, to, we kind of uh, concluded by talking about how God is, Jesus is the one we retreat on, is omnipotent, which means that he's all powerful. And so he's able to work powerfully and mightily in, in a transforming way in each and every situation that we're facing. And we, we talk particularly about how sometimes he doesn't answer our prayers or our requests or our cries to him in the way that we want. And yet that doesn't negate his, his all-powerful, omnipotent, transforming power because he is the only one who is able to make all things work together for his glory and for our good, no matter what. Even if he didn't cause the circumstance that we're in, he's still able to use that circumstance, like Romans 8 tells us, to make all things work together for the good of those who love him and for his glory as well. So if that wasn't enough to retreat on, uh, when we talk about retreating to and retreating on Jesus, we're going to talk about today, how we can, or tonight, how we can retreat on him because he is fully human. And not only does he know in his omniscience everything that we are going through or have gone through, but he actually is able to identify with us as he is the only one who is fully human and fully God. Um, I have a little bit of a, a story to share from, from just this morning. I was on Instagram, you know, a really useful way to spend your time during Corona time. Uh, but but this this quote was on the mustard seed uh, web uh, mustard seed Instagram page for mustard seed Victoria, and it, it made me think of our session together last night. And it says this from the mustard seed Instagram uh, page: "The way we deal with uncertainty says a lot about whether Jesus is ahead of us leading or just behind us carrying our stuff. The way we deal with uncertainty says a lot about whether Jesus is ahead of us leading or just behind us carrying our stuff." And I thought that was pretty appropriate considering what we talked about uh, last night, that sometimes we're in a certain situation and we're just say, hey, Jesus, like, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do that. And I want you to do what I want you to do. But but Jesus is fully God and he's saying, yeah, well, um, your plans might be a little bit different than mine, but I am good and I'm going to act in this situation because my good, what's best for me is actually what's best for you. So is Jesus the one that we're following? Uh, like he's ahead of us, we're following him, or is he just somebody that's behind us carrying our stuff? So we talked last last night, as I said, about Jesus being all powerful, uh, everywhere present, all knowing, and how He doesn't change, dependent on situations. Doesn't matter; He doesn't change. Um, and if all that wasn't enough, yeah, I'm preaching right now. No, no, it's a joint flickering. Oh, sorry, guys. My wife is coming in during the sermon. <laughs> um. She's saying there's a light flicker, flickering, so hopefully that's new, not too distracting for you guys. I don't see a light flickering. It might be my computer screen. Um, okay, where was I? 
So if all of this wasn't enough, that Jesus is fully God and we can retreat on him, we can count on him in the difficulties that we're facing, he actually knows what it's like, what we're experiencing, because he's lived life as a human. And as we'll see, his life wasn't kind of rainbows and unicorns and all type of awesome stuff. He went through some very real and very intense times of uh, suffering, um, discouragement, being abandoned, not knowing what was going to come next, not being happy about where he was. And we talked last night about how a lot of us aren't happy with where we are to varying degrees, right? Sometimes we're not happy because you might have lost a job or you might have even lost a friend or a relative uh, to Corona or something else recently. Um, or you're, or maybe it's kind of a little less severe, but you're just you're just really struggling and you don't like the way things are right now. And Jesus has experienced that to, to a very uh, intense degree. So he's able to identify with even that type of stuff that we're, we're facing right now. Um, about five years ago in, in our youth ministry, there was a, there was a youth who, who showed up and he told me a bit about his story and, you know, I, I knew what he was saying. I could understand what he was saying. And so I knew what he was going through sort of from a mental or intellectual level, but then he started sharing his story with one of our leaders and it turns out that they'd have a lot of the same experiences. They were both from Spanish speaking families both from Latino backgrounds. So right away, once they realized they both spoke Spanish, the conversation just switched into Spanish and I didn't understand what was going on anymore. Um, they both encountered uh, some pretty intense racial profiling and racism uh, in situations with the police. Uh, they both moved from other nations. They both, they just shared this, this cultural heritage and kind of uh, shared experiences, shared brokenness that, that I wasn't able to share, but they were able to understand because they'd had some shared experiences. And so it is with the one that we retreat on Jesus. He has actual shared experiences with us because he's lived life as a human. My wife, when our um, daughter started preschool, our daughter had a very difficult time, just separation anxiety, and she was scared about school, and kids said something to her that she didn't like, and that became a big deal. A substitute teacher said something to her that she didn't like, and that was really, really difficult for her. And so my wife was explaining to me how hard it is um, every morning taking her to school. And so I thought I understood, you know, I know what you're saying. I can see how difficult this is. You know, she's, uh, our daughter's screaming and crying every morning when you're bringing her to school. That must be really tough. And then one morning, our, our other child had a doctor's appointment. So Candace had to take him to the doctor's appointment. So I had to take our daughter to school. And man, one day, and I almost left the school in tears. I, it was so difficult. And I came home and I said to Candace, my wife, I said, now I know what you're talking about. Like, I thought I knew what you were experiencing, but now I know. I actually have an experiential knowledge of what you're facing. And so the one that we're retreating on when we talk about retreating to and retreating on Jesus, we're talking about retreating to somebody who has lived a human life, somebody who has suffered, somebody who has tempted as a human, who has been weak as a human, who has been tired, has been surrounded by unknowns, who has been surrounded by sickness, surrounded by disappointment, so he not only knows about what we're going through, but he has actually been through it. We retreat back on Jesus because he's fully God and he's fully able, yes. And we retreat back on him because he's fully, he's fully human and fully able to understand and um, identify with what we've been through. The one we retreat on has lived through times of uncertainty like we're in now. So if you have your, your Bibles with you or you bring it up on the screen or whatever it might be. Um, as you know, we're in the book of Hebrews. So we're going to be today, we're in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So I'm just going to pray for us. I'm going to ask God to bring his peace and his presence in this time. And then we're going to uh, continue in the word for this uh, retreat. God, thank you that you are the God of all peace. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. Holy Spirit, you bring peace. And so I ask that you'd minister peace to us in this time. Peace to us in these days where there are anxieties and there are unknowns and there are fears and there are worries. And in the midst of that, we can look to you knowing that you understand what we're facing. Knowing that you are the only one who fully understands what we're facing and you are the only one who is fully able to act in what we're facing. So Jesus, we look to you 
and we ask you to speak to us through your word today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're just going to dive in. We're going to look at this sort of verse by verse. Uh, again, if you're just turning, tuning in, we're in chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 14 to 16. So if we start in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Uh, Hebrews is the only book where we're told that Jesus is called the great high priest. Uh, and a person who is reading the book of Hebrews on first the first sort of pass, particularly if they had a Jewish background or an understanding of Judaism, they would kind of be shocked right away because they go, wait, wait, Jesus is the great high priest, but isn't that guy from the tribe of Judah? And all the other priests are from Levi, so what's going on with that? Uh, so Hebrews kind of puts a lot of effort into explaining why he's the great high priest and why that is, why he's a, why he's a better high priest um, than, than any priest that's seen before. And, and it's because those two things we've already talked about, how he's fully human and fully God. He can share in the flesh and blood that, that we have and our experiences. He sympathizes with our temptations and our weaknesses, yet he was without sin. He was tested and tried. He went through trials and yet was without sin. But he's also the better high priest because he's divine as well. So he's unlike any, unlike any other high priest who has to continually offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. He offered himself once and for all as the final sacrifice for sin. So if a priest is a mediator, this type of mediator or a go between for between two two groups or sort of a middle person, um, when you're looking for a mediator, you really want somebody that represents the two parties that are that are trying to be mediated, right? I mean, wouldn't it be helpful right now? I mean, I know all the the wet sweat and stuff and all that type of thing is kind of on pause right now as as the COVID uh, corona pandemic is taking place. That's kind of taken the the front seat. But wouldn't it be amazing if if the mediator between the government and uh, the different nations involved and different and different had, had sort of an understanding and a stake in each of these 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 groups or um, maybe the be better way I can illustrate it is when when I worked at a, a roofing supplies uh, place I think I mentioned this place yesterday uh, in Calgary and we had we had a I worked out in the, in the yard it was called so that's where they build the shingle orders and we load them on trucks and stuff like that and everybody smokes cigarettes and like eats cold hamburgers and junk food and energy drinks except for me because i'm healthy kind of maybe a little bit <laughs> um so we, we were out in the yard and our and our the yard manager was sort of the go-between was the mediator between the guys out in the yard and the office staff and there was a lot of conflict sometimes between these two groups and one yard manager that came along um instead of staying out with us and working out with us in the heat and in the cold and building the orders and then going into to talk with the office and then coming out with us uh sort of sort of being a a representative of both groups and mediating between the two groups having an understanding and being able to identify with both groups uh we had we had a yard manager who decided first first week he decided well the first thing i need to do is get off a forklift not be building orders outside in the cold with these guys i need to go inside and have my office inside with the office people so i'll have more respect and i'll kind of be higher up well didn't go over very well and uh, i don't think he lasted more than a few months because none of us felt like he none of us felt like he represented us none of us felt like we could identify with him none of us felt like he belonged with us or that we could identify with him but jesus is actually able to mediate between these two parties, humans and God, because he's the only one who is human and God. So he's the only one who's fully God. He's the only one that's fully human. And as that, that mediator, that great high priest, he's able to fully identify with both groups. Not only is he a great high priest because he's able to fully identify with both groups and he's offered that once and for all sacrifice instead of a continual sacrifice of animals for the forgiveness of sins, but he's passed through the heavens, as we see again in verse 14, that Jesus has passed through the heavens, which basically means that he's, he's gone through, he has arrived, he's gone through the heavens, and he's now seated as a representative to God in heaven. Uh, 924, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 9, verse 24 of Hebrews tells us that Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of our God on our behalf. Uh, Romans 8.34 says something very similar, that, that, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Which is pretty amazing when you think about it. The one that we're being invited to retreat on, the one that we're being uh, called to follow, the one that we're being called saying, uh, Jesus saying, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is the one who is seated next to God on our behalf, who is interceding at the right hand of God on our behalf, who is in the presence of the Father appearing on our behalf, so the one that you retreat to, 
I mean, I'm not sure what's going on in your life with the coronavirus and all of this different stuff, or maybe maybe the difficulties you're facing or the joys you're facing have nothing to do with any of that. But when, when, when you retreat on Jesus, you're retreating on one who is sitting at the right hand of God and who is actually talking to God, interceding to God, interceding with God on your behalf. So he's a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, who is seated at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. Let us hold fast to our confession, confession is the end of at the end of verse 14, which is which is a call to to hold fast what God says to be true, to confess what he confesses, to say to be true, what he what he says to be true. There's a continuing a need for perseverance there, a call to faithfulness. So because Jesus is our great high priest, because he is all these things, fully human, fully divine, and because he understands you, because he's interceding for you, because he's your mediator, we, we need to hold fast to what he's called us to do and continue to confess him to be these things. Uh, let's go to the next verse. For we do not have, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. So we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, which is a dun double negative, right? We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. So basically you could take out those negatives and it says we do have a high priest who is able to sympathize with what we're going through. Why? Because the one we retreat on, the next part of the verse, in every respect has been tempted as we are. There's a sympathy that he has. And I think in future translations, we'll probably have the word empathy in there because it seems that sympathy and empathy are becoming farther apart, whereas sympathy is being able to feel sorry for somebody that's going through something. You know, you kind of feel, well, my sympathy is for you and your loss. I don't really know what that's like, but I have sympathy for you. And that, that's not fully um, encapsulating everything that's being said here because Jesus not only is able to say, oh, I'm sorry for that thing you're going through over there, but he's actually able to feel and identify with what we're going through as he's lived life as a human. He's suffered as a human. He's been rejected as a human. He's been discouraged as a human. So there's that sympathy or maybe, like I said, maybe in future translations, there'll be empathy uh, included that as well because those words, the way that we use them now in English seems to be changing a little bit. So as he lived out his life on earth, his fully human life, Jesus maintained his full divinity, but he didn't make use of his power as fully God. So it's almost like Jesus maintained his God identity, but he did not make use of his God ability. He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. So he was tempted, he was tested, he was tried in, in every respect, just as we are. He didn't simply brush away temptation as nothing, but he went through real trials and temptations. We see him facing these real struggles. We see him facing this real weakness, real pain, real loss, real grief. Jesus wept over the dead. Um, he knew hunger. He lived uh, his earthly life in a world where there were very serious illnesses and sicknesses around. Um, he felt anxiety and anguish over his upcoming humiliation and torture and crucifixion. Real anguish actually to the point of sweating blood when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I, look, I looked that up because it's something that kind of is sometimes a question that's raised, well, is that is that a real thing? Can that actually happen? And so so I did, did, did just a little bit of research. Maybe you guys have uh, done research and found even more, and you can you can share that later during the, the discussion. But uh, I went on to the U.S. National Library of Med Medicine, uh, and it's a condition, sweating blood is a, a condition called hem hematohydrosis, and it's a rare clinical phenomenon. And this is a quote, caused by severe mental anxiety to a degree that causes hemorrhage of vessels supplying the sweat glands into the ducts of the sweat glands, end quote. So basically you're so uh, anxious or in, in anguish that the vessels that supply uh, blood to the sweat glands burst and the blood gets into the sweat glands and then it's sweat out. So when we think about Jesus, do we think that he's experienced a deep and real anguish, deep and real sorrow and anxiety? I think that this is telling us yes. I think that this is telling us yes. And I'm not I'm not saying that he necessarily experienced a fretful or worried anxiety, but he experienced an anxiety that maybe is like some of what us what, what we're what we're experiencing right now. He's in a place knowing what's before him. God said, you know, he God knows he knows he's gonna have to go to the cross for us because of his love for us to pay the penalty for our sins that we should have paid. And he's in anguish and in sorrow because he's saying, I don't want to go through this. This is going to be awful. I mean, he's not, he's not crazy. Yeah, well, awesome. I'm going to get crucified today. That's going to be sweet. He's thinking, this is going to be awful. This is going to be painful. This is going to be terrible. This is going to be horrible and horrendous. And yet he submits to the Father's will. And I think that's a very human experience for those of us who follow uh, Christ, who follow Jesus, because sometimes we're called into places we don't want to go to. 
we talked last night about how um, a lot of us maybe don't want to be exactly where we are right now. We wish things were different. And we talked last night about how sometimes God's calling us to unpack our bags where we are, even if it's not exactly where we want to be at this time. We talked about how the Israelites, when they were traveling in the wilderness after their um, deliverance from Egypt, they followed God's presence. It was a fire by night and a, and a sort of a pillar of cloud or by day. And when the, when the pillar stopped, they unpacked their bags and they started to set up. And when the pillar moved, they packed everything up and they went. They didn't know how long they were going to have to unpack. God didn't say, okay, I'm stopping here for two months. Get everything out. Or, hey, I'm only stopping here overnight, so just get your tents out. It's no big deal. When the, when the presence of God stopped, when they were where they were, they unpacked and they started to make camp. And I think that for some of us, we need to recognize that we don't want to be where we are. We don't want to go through what we're going through. Or we don't want to go through what might be coming. Um, but that might be where we are. And we can identify with Jesus in that because he has been in that exact situation, probably in, in a much more extreme and a much more um, intense sense where he's about to be crucified and he knows that that's going to happen. And he's saying to God, God, I don't want to go through this, but your will be done. So there's this deep uh, anxiety or anguish or sorrow. Um, and yet in the midst of that, there's a deep obedience. So he was tempted and tried in every way, yet, yet, the verse, verse 15 carries on, yet he was without sin. And this is an encouragement that we can face these things, these temptations, these trials, all these horrible things that we might be going through. Or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe your, your experience in the COVID-19 situation is super difficult. Maybe it's kind of medium. Maybe you think it's not that bad, but when you stop and think, you're like, yeah, this, this is kind of tough. And there's, there's a heightened level of stress there. Um, but Jesus faced all these trials, all these temptations, and yet he did not sin. So that's an encouragement to us to know that, wow, we can go through all these difficult things. And if we rely on the Holy Spirit as Jesus did, we're able to, we're able to go through these things without sin. And we also know because we have this great high priest who has offered this once and for all sacrifice that when we do sin, if we confess to him that he is faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's just, there's just freedom and grace there. Not to do whatever you want, but there's freedom and grace to know that you have been forgiven when you confess that sin. And there's freedom and grace to go forward knowing that Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. Um, and I want you to be free too from thinking that temptation is sin. Maybe you're dealing with some intense temptations right now. Uh, you're spending a lot more time at home. A um, little, little bit of extra stress is going on. Maybe you're tempted to look at things you shouldn't look at on the internet. Maybe you're tempted to uh, waste time in a way that you shouldn't waste time. Maybe you're tempted to eat more than you know that you should just to try and make yourself feel better. Or maybe you're tempted to drink more alcohol than you know you should just to try and uh, make yourself feel better, these different types of things. And and I want you to know that those things are sin and you can be forgiven those things when you confess those. But I also want you to know that to be tempted to do things isn't sin. I mean, Jesus was horribly tempted to do all these different things and that was not sin. Only when, only if he had given into those things would it have been sin. So I want you to retreat on the fact that you can be in stressful, difficult times and by the the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to enter into sin. I want you to retreat on the one who has been tempted because he knows what it's like. So when you're praying, you're saying, Jesus, help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just feel so tempted to do this thing I, I know I shouldn't do. Um, know that he's been through that and know that he's actually interceding because he's the great high priest. He's interceding before God and he's seated at, right, at the right hand of God on your behalf right now. So your prayers are being heard by one who's experienced temptation, who's experienced trials, and he's taking those before the throne. I, that's awesome. I mean, if you retreat on that thought for a little while, I think that's amazing. And and again, if you sin, then you know that you you can confess and repent and you're retreating on one who's the great high priest who's actually offered the payment for your sin once and for all. And that sin can be cleansed and wiped away and you can go forward kind of just free in grace and light again to face, to face the next challenge. Um, that he was without sin is also a challenge and an exhortation uh, that our suffering and our hardship... And our more stressful times in life are no excuse for sin. I think that it's safe to say that Jesus experienced uh, more difficulties. I mean, not a lot of us have been uh, known that we're going to be crucified and yet we're obedient to that and didn't sin. Um, so I want to want to encourage you and exhort you or kind of challenge you that just because things are difficult and there's an increase in stress or things aren't the way that you, you want them to be or maybe they're really terrible that this isn't an excuse for sin. I know so often as humans we think, well... 
this happened and this happened and this happened and I just can't take it anymore so I'm going to do this. Or, well, I wouldn't have done this if things were a little bit better. No, Jesus faced every trial and temptation and was subject to weakness and yet was without sin. So our difficulties, our trials, our uh, hardships are not an excuse for that. So when we look at um, Jesus, the one that we retreat on, we looked at his power and his divinity. We also looked at how he's able to act on our behalf. Um, and we talked out about how we need to know the one we retreat back on. That because we can rely on him like a child running back to a parent for safety. Remember how I talked about how uh, if our kids are scared, sometimes they'll run back to us because they know us and they know they can rely on us. And they, they, they know that we can help or sometimes they think that we can help more than we can. Um, but they'll run back to us for safety. So there needs to be uh, a retreat back to somebody that, ha that we understand and that has an ability to help us. And we want the one that we retreat back to to actually not just know about what we're going through, but to have an experience uh, similar to what we're going for, or, e or even an identity of having lived life as a human. And in Jesus, we have both. In the one that we retreat on, we have God, Jesus, God, fully God, who's fully able to act in the different situations or circumstances that we have are and are facing. And we have Jesus, the one who's fully human, who's fully able to identify with what we're going through. And there's nobody else in the, in the universe that has that um, claim to being fully God and fully man and has that experiential knowledge and that ability to act in power. Um, a couple months ago, or not, no, I guess a couple weeks ago, because it was in the midst of Corona times, I guess time's kind of stretching out these days. But a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the youth that I work with uh, contacted me about a friend who's struggling severely with anxiety. And this youth said, uh, Cam, you really need to connect with this other youth who's facing this situation that's causing them a lot of anxiety, massive amounts of anxiety. And I said, yeah, like I'm, I'm happy to connect with them. But there isn't really a lot that I can do about the situation that they're facing. Like that one's way out of, like it's not even, I can't have any, anything to do with that situation that they're facing. But the youth said to me, you know, oh, I know that. Like, I know you can't help with that situation, but I really want you to talk to my friend because you know what anxiety is like. You've been through it. Um, this youth wanted me to talk with, with their friend because they knew that I used to have a severe struggle with anxiety. Um, you know, like I mentioned yesterday, sometimes to the point of being sick on the way to school and in high school and stuff like that. So this youth, this youth just said, hey, you know what it's like to face this. So I want you to connect with my friend who's going through something similar. And Jesus, the one that we retreat on, has this experiential knowledge of what it is to be human. And um, unlike me in this situation, Jesus is actually able, he has the ability to help and move in mighty ways. So he has the ability to understand in an experiential way. And he has the ability to act in a way that is, is, is beyond anything that a human could do. So that's verse 15. If we move on uh, to verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So because of verse 14 and verse 15, we can have verse 16. Because Jesus is our great high priest who has gone through the heavens, who is now seated at the right hand of God, and because he can understand and can identify with what we go through, because he is without sin, because he has offered his life as a once and for all sacrifice, we now have verse 16, where we can go with confidence and boldness before the throne of God. This is, this is incredible. The one that we retreat on, we can, we can pass right through these different curtains that used to be there to separate people from the holy place and from the holy of holies. Jesus has made a way right in because he's offered his blood that we would be cleansed and be able to go right into that holy of holies and not just kind of go into the holy of holies in a fearful state. Um, and yes, we should have a fearful reverence and awe before God. Um, but go in there with, with confidence and boldness to find grace and help in the time of need. Uh, we, can draw, we can draw near, right? It says draw near with confidence to the throne of God. So we can actually draw near to God. We can retreat on him in nearness and closeness because Jesus, our great high priest, has offered that once and for all sacrifice, his own life in our place. There's now no barrier between us and God for those who've repented and trusted in his sacrifice in their place. We've actually been declared not guilty before God we can draw near, we can really retreat to him, we can really retreat on him without barriers, we can go right to the throne of grace. We have full access to God through our great high priest, Jesus. When our great high priest uh, offered himself as a perfect once and for all sacrifice on the cross, the temple curtain was actually torn 
from from top to bottom. So it's signifying this is something that only God can do to open this holy of holy places. It's torn in two, not to be sewed up again. That holy of holies is open to those who have put their faith in Christ. So they're able to enter in with confidence. We have access to the presence of God. That's incredible. We have access. And not only can we draw near to his presence with, with, uh, with sort of that nearness, but we actually have a confidence. We can draw near with confidence. And this confidence is kind of, uh, it's speaking to sort of a boldness and even a freedom of speech, being able to be open and honest without concealment, unreserved in speech, being able to speak plainly. So the same, the same word that's used here for confidence is, uh, is when it, used in John 10 when, when people are saying to Jesus, like, if, if, you're, if you're the Christ, just tell us plainly. So that plainly is the same word that's used for confidence or boldness or freedom of speech. So, so people are just saying, like, put aside all the kind of, like, pretensions and stuff. Just say what you need to say. And this is, this is the relationship that we're being invited into now with God. Uh, in Acts 2.29, Peter says, let me freely speak to you about Jesus when he's, when he's about to give that, that sermon in Acts 2. Let me freely speak to you. This is the same word that we're given in confidence where, where we're able to freely speak before God because of what Jesus has done for us. We don't have to pretend before God how we're feeling. And actually, we can't. We're able to be open um, with what you're going through. You're able to be bold in what you ask for. And I think that's important to know during times of suffering you know, you don't have to pretend that you're super happy. You don't have to go, dear Lord, I'm so happy for everything you've done in my life. Things are a little bit difficult, but I just want to bless you. Amen. You can be, you can be confident and bold in your prayers towards him because of what Jesus has done, because Jesus is your mediator, because Jesus is your great high priest. You have this access to draw near with confidence and boldness. And I don't mean in a demanding or frivolous sense, like you just walk into God's house and put your feet up on the table and say, hey, Jesus, hey, God, do whatever I want. That's not the type of thing that I'm talking about, but I'm talking about how you can be open and honest and boldly ask what you need for, because it says we can seek his mercy and grace in our time of need, and he's going to give it. And it also it also tells us that confidence, that boldness, that freedom of speech tells us that he can handle our emotions and our questions in prayer. You see Job asking some very difficult questions of God in the book of Job. And at the end of the book, he's declared righteous. God's saying, yes, you, you, you are declared righteous. Uh, you spoke rightly. Um, what's more, we see just a chapter later in the book of Hebrews in, in chapter 5, verse 7, that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. So if, if God can handle uh, Jesus' emotions in prayer, I think he can handle ours. If Jesus is able to pray with loud, with loud cries and tears to God, then I think we can as well. Um, don't think that you need to hide your emotions or what you're going through when you go, when you go before God, particularly if you put your faith in Christ and you know that he's your great high priest and he's actually sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you and you're being told right now as we're talking in the scriptures in verse, four, in verse 16 of chapter 4 that you can go with that boldness, you can go with that confidence before him, you can be open about what you're going through when you go before him. Uh, maybe you're laid off. Maybe you don't know what the future will look like. Maybe your sun, summer plans, if you're a student and all your next semester and all, all your plans are uncertain. Uh, maybe you're struggling with temptations and even sin in a new way uh, during these times that are a little more stressful or a lot more stressful depending on your situation. Know that you have a great high priest, one that you can retreat on, a God that cares for you, one that's able to identify with what you've been through as fully human and is able and powerful to act as fully God. A God who cares for you, who's telling you in his word that you can draw near to him, that with confidence and freedom of speech, you can bring your requests to the throne of grace and mercy to find help in your time of need. So the one we retreat on is Abel. Jesus is fully God. He's all powerful. He's everywhere present, all knowing. He never changes. No matter what the situation, the circumstances are going through, he doesn't change. Even if our situations and our circumstances change, he's able to move and work and transform in and through every situation. He is the only one who can make all things work together for the good of those who love him and for his glory. The one we retreat on understands experientially the struggles of being human, your struggles, because the one we retreat on is fully able to understand because he's identified with humanity. He's lived life as a fully human, uh, he's lived life, a fully human life. He knows our struggles. He knows our weaknesses. He is our mediator, a great high priest, and gives us full access and boldness and confidence before the presence of God. So retreat there 
with Jesus, your great high priest, in the presence of God, with boldness and in confidence. Amen. I'm going to open up the Facebook page on my computer here so I can see if there's any uh, comments or questions. And um, maybe I'll pray. Maybe I'll pray as well. As we as we conclude here, uh, the speaking time. Obviously, there's there's about 25 minutes here. If we want to have any uh, discussion or any comments or questions, so let me let me pray. So, Father, thank you for your word. Um, I'm encouraged studying it. I'm encouraged sharing it, and I and I pray that it would be an encouragement to each of us that's listening. Even if somebody just logged in for 30 seconds, that they would have heard something that would draw them nearer to you. And I pray for us who are who are on this this retreat together that uh, that we would see how much we're able to retreat on you in difficult circumstances, in good circumstances, in all circumstances, we can retreat on you because you're able to fully identify with what we've gone through. You're able to fully identify with what we're going through. And you're powerful and able to act. And thanks, God, that you love us. Thanks, Jesus, that you care enough about us to grow to the cross. Thank you, Father, that you that you wanted relationship with us enough that you didn't just wipe us out but that you have a plan to save us and to bring us into relationship with you. I pray that this uh, time together, the next little while, would be profitable, would, would draw us nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if there's any uh, questions or comments or any other verses you want to share, um, for those of you who kind of joined a little bit late, we're just in... Um, Hebrews chapter 4 for Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's online retreat for the English congregation. And we just, we just talked about how we're able to retreat on Jesus because he's able to identify with us as having lived a life as fully human. So if you have any questions or any comments or anything like that, feel free, feel free to share those now. Uh, okay, Liana Wong asks, has God ever called you into places you didn't want to go to? Um, for me, yes. Um, I think that the first example that comes to mind, I shared a little bit about this yesterday. I shared a little bit about uh, being laid off from, from one job uh, when I was in Calgary when the economic slowdown happened in 2010 how I got laid off from one building supplies place and within another week I had a job at another building supplies place so I was thankful for that provision but I did not like that job um, the people there were not as nice as at the other place that I was working at uh, it was the middle of winter so it was cold and miserable uh, it was it was a lot less pay and it was a lot further away from my house it almost it almost felt like why am I here? Um, but I but I remember saying to God, okay, Lord, like I feel like this is where you have me now. So what's what's the scoop? How can I be how can I be useful here? How can I how can I serve you and honor you in this time? And there was actually a lot of opportunities to share with people because once once people found out that I was a part time worker, which is pretty unusual in those um, type of workplace settings, most people are doing that for for full time. So they say, "Oh, you're part time. Why don't you know? Why are you so lazy? Why do you only work three days a week?" And I would say, "Well, I'm actually a student full time, and this is just on top of being a student to try and keep those those costs you know paid for from 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 my studies." And then they say, oh, what are you studying? I said, oh, I'm studying theology. Oh, what's that? Like, are you going to be a priest? And then I would explain, well, sort of, sort of not. And then we'd have a bigger discussion about, you know, what it is that I'm studying. And there'd be questions about Jesus and, and uh, you know, opportunities to share about him and stuff like that. Um, so that, that's the one that comes to mind for me. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people who are listening have, have faced way more difficult things that they definitely didn't want to go through or, or going to a place that they didn't want to go to. Um but I think uh, I didn't really think of it at that time. But looking back now, I think it would have really helped me if I thought about how, oh, I could really identify with, with Jesus. I could really retreat on him in this time, knowing that he has gone through numerous things that he didn't want to go through. Uh, but he he was he was submitted to the will of God uh, in those things. So good question. Thank you, Liana. Chrissy says, thanks for the word of God. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, any other questions or comments that anybody might have? Any verses you want to share? If there's anything, if there's anything that uh, you think about that you might want to share. Uh, 
Uh, okay, Aaron asks, how did you make the decision to become a Christian? Was it a difficult decision? Uh, very, very good question, Aaron. Uh, how did you make the decision to become a Christian? Was it a difficult decision? Uh, I decided to become a Christian sort of over a process of about a year when I was 11. I think I just about turned 12. Uh, I started going to a youth group. I was invited by a friend to go to youth group. And, you know, I wasn't really into church. I never went to church. I think I went to church once when I was in Cubs and I had no idea what was going on because we, we used the hall of the church. So like once a year we'd go to church as Cubs to like say thank you or whatever. And I had no idea what was going on. I had a, I had a pretty big um, disdain for God. I'm like, oh, this is so stupid. It's just for kind of for people that, that want something to make them feel better. So I went to this youth group and, and it was really fun and the people there were really awesome. And... um you know, there would be like these discussions or whatever about God and that type of thing. And I didn't really want to listen to them. I just wanted to play the games and hang out. But then over time, as these discussions were, were going on, I, I kind of realized like, oh, like I actually like a lot of these things that he's teaching, whether it's kind of like how we should treat one another or, or what, what God's like. So I started to listen a little bit more. Um, and then, then over time, like I, I just like started to listen more and more. And then I realized that the people at this group actually the ones who were Christians actually had something that I didn't had, have. And that was difficult for me because I knew that I had as good or better grades. I knew that I was as good or better at sports. Um, my family was pretty good. Like all these different things that, that, that they had that I had as well or, or better. And yet they still had something that I didn't have. So I started listening even more closely. Uh, and then, and then when I was actually at a camp and the message was being shared about how, um, because of our sin, because we'd done things that were wrong, uh, humanity as a whole and us as individuals were separated from God because of our sin and how God had made a way that we could have a relationship with him. He paid the penalty for our sin because he's fully just, so he can't just kind of wipe our sin onto the carpet and pretend it didn't happen. Um, but he's fully loving, so he doesn't want us to just be condemned and separated from him for all of eternity. And so when, when the guy was sharing about how we'd sinned, I was like, whoa, I know that I've done things that are bad. Like that, that wasn't a question for me. I wasn't arguing with that. I was like, yep, I've done things that are bad. And then when he talked about how our relationship was broken with God, I was like, whoa, I didn't even believe in God before this. And I didn't even think about this stuff. But yeah, like, I, I think that's true. Like, I think my relationship with God is broken. And once I realized that, that I had sinned, and once I realized that my relationship with a holy and loving God was broken, the decision from that point was actually pretty pretty easy once God was kind of moving in my heart. Um, and then how, how I became, a, the decision became a Christian is just basically just, I, I, I was sort of led uh, with a friend, he just kind of like took me through a prayer of saying, hey, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I want to follow you. Uh, would you come and, and live with him, within me by your Holy Spirit and, and take uh, sort of like rulership of my life? I want to follow you and, and um, submit the things that I do in my life to you. And that's how the, that's how the journey kind of began uh, for me. Uh, good question, Aaron. Uh, Young Ming Yang asks... Uh, how important is the cultural context when studying passages? Is it detrimental to be too focused on context? Um, I think I, I'm assuming you're talking about, or I'm, I, I think this is a broader question, not just for these questions, but for all passages. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and answer it that way. Uh, I think the cultural context is always, always important. Uh, so, so, so if you're trying to understand the Bible, the first step you're going to want to take is understanding what it meant to the people that it was originally written to, which is a lot of times easier said than done, right? Because I mean, the new Testament's 2000 years old and the old Testament is even, is even older. Um, and, and cultures were very different expectations, wants, desires, all sorts of things. Um, some things, lots of things were very different. Some things are still the same. So I think, uh, doing, doing as much as we can to understand, the cultural context and what it meant to the original hearers or, or receivers of the word is important. And because from then, from there, if we understand what it originally meant to that group and, and what that was written to and what different cultural things it was written to, then we're able to take that and uh, with the Spirit's help, see how it might apply to, to our world today and to our lives as individuals. Uh, I think the only time that it could be detrimental to be too focused on context would be if we get um, bogged down in the sense of thinking that we can't 
come to the word as it is and just read the Bible that we think like we, we need to have stacks of commentaries around us for every single time we want to meet with God and his word. Um, and I'm not against that. I think that's awesome to really want to study the word of God and know what it meant as an original context and how we can apply it now to our lives. Uh, but I think that, I think that's when it would become detrimental is when, is when we think that we can't ever read the word of God just, just as it is and expect the Holy spirit to speak to us. Um, I hope I hope that helps answer that. And Aaron, I hope I answered your question well too. Uh, so if if, I, if there's anything more you want to ask there, please add to that. Um, uh, Tom asks, "How do I share my belief with my children when they go against me?" Uh, and he was baptized in the name of Jesus. So I'm, I'm Tom saying his his uh, son was baptized in the name of Jesus, and he wants to share his belief with his son, but his his children uh, go against him. Uh, yeah. Wow. I'm, uh, thankful that I haven't had to face that yet. Cause my kids are, my kids are, are, are too young right now. Um, but I, I think that, I think that it's through, through prayer, through action and through words. Uh, Paul says in Thessalonians, he says to the Thessalonians, he says, I loved you so much that I shared with you, not only the gospel, but my very life as well. Um, so he had such a, a care for them. He actually goes on to talk about how he was like a nursing mother to them. Like, and that's an intense care when you, when, if you've seen a mother uh, nursing a child and caring for it, it's a very intense care. So Paul's saying that he, he's willing to share with them his, his words, like the truth of the gospel and also his very life as well. So he's willing to uh, share with them the actions. And I think that you, you can only, you can really only do as much as you can do in the sense of praying, uh, sharing with them and, uh, that they'll see a transformed life. If your life's been transformed, they're going to see that. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. Thanks Tom for asking that. Uh, any other questions or comments? Anybody that did ask a question, if I didn't answer your question fully or didn't answer your question in the way you wanted it, uh, answered, uh, you can make that clear as well. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll give it just a couple more minutes here in case there's anybody typing something out. And uh, while, while those while those two minutes are kind of uh, ticking down, I'll I'll remind you that uh, these these uh, sermon videos from my uh, <laughs> my office in the corner where we used to have a pile of stuff for Virage sale, but is now my home office. Uh, they'll be they'll be available on Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's Facebook page and Victoria Chinese Alliance. Uh, church's website and our our third session for the online retreat will be next saturday may 2nd at 8 p.m to 9 p.m and then the sunday morning will be the fourth session and that will be uh, the sunday morning service online for victoria chinese alliance church's english congregation and that's at 9 a.m and you can join that on their on their website and uh, i think their facebook page as well okay uh candace writes uh candace is the one who, who came in and said there was a light flickering and we figured out we think it's the computer screen so i was really confused when she walked in and was talking about lights flickering um but she's awesome she was just trying to help i was really confused uh okay candace says context is definitely important for understanding scripture and reading the bible knowing that the word is living and active making sure that we're asking the spirit to illuminate it in our lives yes good point candace in fact uh Two verses before the verses that we are in tonight is, is, is are those verses in the Bible. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So awesome, awesome point, Candice. Uh, Julie says, thanks for sharing God's word. Thank you, Julie, for joining us. Uh, oh, Daniel, great question. How did I not, how did I not have a practical application today? Well done. Okay. So Daniel asks, what are some things we can do to practice retreating on Jesus? Uh, from, from the stuff we've talked about the two, the, the last two, uh, nights, I would recommend meditating on those truths, thinking on what that what that means in the situation meditating on the word of god that, that we've talked about in those in those areas 
um, practicing bringing bringing things before Jesus, knowing that He can identify with you. So when you're when you're speaking to Jesus, when you're bringing your prayers before Him, when you're bringing your prayers before God, knowing that uh, you're you're speaking to one who's able, who knows what you're going through before you need before you need it, who's present with you. Uh, who's able to not only act and transform, but also able to act in every situation for his glory and for our good. Um, and then, and then knowing that the one we talk to is able to identify with what we're going through. So I think it's, I think it's uh, meditating and reflecting on and thinking on the truth uh, about God and spending that time with him in prayer, whether that's the actual bringing the things before him that we need to bring before him, or whether it's just, um, being silent sort of before those truths. So setting those truths before us in our heart or in our mind, and then being silent uh, before them. And that, that doesn't necessarily, I know when we think about meditation, uh, we often think of, you know, sitting in stillness. And I think that can be good. Sometimes I like to um, walk or go somewhere where I can sit by the ocean or something like that, where there's something that I can kind of uh, focus on and think about those truths as well. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit last night too, when somebody asked about what we can do in, when we're feeling anxious. And I think sometimes the retreating on Jesus, uh, we don't we don't want to make that just one more to do on our to do list. So sometimes it might just be setting a timer for twenty minutes, and just just sitting there, or laying there, and saying, "Okay, God, uh, I love you. Uh, you love me more than I could ever know, and I'm just gonna be still for twenty minutes. I'm not gonna try and accomplish anything with you. I'm not gonna try and." go anywhere in prayer or bring anything that needs to change before you. I'm just going to, just going to be with you. Um, I'm trying to think other practical things. Yeah. I think, I think extended periods of time, maybe if you can take, I'm not, I'm not sure Daniel, what your schedule is like in these days, but maybe, you know, setting aside a day to, to prayer and journaling and scripture reading or, uh, you know, a half day or an evening, or maybe making a weekly, a weekly time. Um, I think those are those are the things that come to mind. I hope those are helpful. If anybody else has any ideas uh, on what it would look like to to practice retreating on Jesus, uh, feel free to put those in the comments as well. All right, I'll give it another couple minutes. If there's any questions or comments, anything anybody wants to share, just if you're if you're typing right now, I don't want to cut you off. Thanks for being patient too with with uh, technical stuff and and uh, for all of us who are involved in church online now it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit different. I can I can tell you that it's a very it's a very different um, feeling to speak into my camera, seeing my own face instead of uh, being with you in an actual uh, physical setting. So, Lord, we pray that we can get back to those those times together soon. Yeah, I'll just give it one more minute here. Oh, Candace, here we go. She's got something else. So Candace says, sometimes I don't know what to pray. Uh, so listening to worship music and soaking the words helped me to retreat on Jesus. Yeah, good one. Very, very good. Um, I like that. Uh, sometimes too, uh, Daniel and, and everybody else listening, you know, what, what are some of the things we can practice to retreat on Jesus? Uh, I think sometimes the basic things are still the basic things, but all of us have different uh, personalities and even throughout life, things might look a little different for how we do those things. So I think it's important to be, to be aware of how you have uh, met with God and how he seems to have wired you and to pursue those things is, is, is okay. I mean, we're not going to, it's not like you're going to say, okay, well, I'm just going to listen to worship music and not read the Bible anymore and throw it out um, or vice versa. Uh, but it, it is, it is okay to be aware of how, how God has, has met with you in past times and to be uh, aware of how he might've wired you. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining Victoria Chinese Alliance's uh, online retreat session number two for the English congregation. Uh, we will be back together next Saturday, May 2nd at 8 p.m. Uh, same thing, about a 30, I probably went more than 30 minutes today. 
maybe it was 35 minutes uh, message and some time for question and answer and comments uh, to be shared. Uh, I do wish we could we could be sitting together and discussing this stuff over over some food or, or something like that uh, at 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 Imidine, but maybe another year. Um, so next Saturday, eight to nine p.m., we'll be together, uh, same place on on Facebook Live, and the the recordings of the of session one, if you missed it, or session two, if you're just if you're just logging in late or you, or you want to watch it again or something like that, they'll be available on Victoria Chinese Alliance's Facebook page and on Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's uh, website. So thank you so much for joining us. And and I do pray that, that in these days that you will be able to retreat on Jesus, that you will have uh, an intense uh, time of meeting with him and being called forward into, into everything that he has for you. Because I don't think that this is just a time we need to get through and then we'll come out the other side and we'll kind of get back tomorrow to, to normal. I think that this is where we are now and I think that God is calling us to things here and now. And I think that things he'll call us to new things uh, when this is over. So don't just kind of retreat out of this, right? Jesus says, um, I don't want them to be taken out of the world, but I don't want them to be of the world. So don't get dragged into worldly things when you're when you're extra stressed, uh, when when you're filled with anxieties or, or uncertainties, right? We know that Jesus lived with those things, and he and he and he was tempted and, t- and tried and tested in every way, was weakened, and yet he didn't sin, uh, and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and you can call on him for for empowering for that. Um, I'm starting to preach a sermon again, so <laughs> uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next Saturday.